Now it's my great honor and pleasure to introduce the presenter for the Founders Memorial Lecture. The Founders Memorial, Le Memorial Lecture, for those of you who don't know, was established in 1958 to honor the memory of scientists who made outstanding contributions to entomology. Walter Leal is a distinguished professor of molecular and cellular biology at the University of California, UC Davis, former chair and professor of the Department of Entomology at Davis. He holds a Bachelor's of Engineering in Chemical Engineering from Universidad Federal de Pernambuco and both MS in Agricultural Chemistry from Mayai University and PhD in Applied Biochemistry from Tsukuba University in Japan. During his tenure in Japan, Leal spent a sabbatical at Cornell with Jerry Meinwald, Tom Eisner's longtime collaborator, along with his twin brother, and now ESA Vice President Alvin Simmons, and President Tomorrow. Leal served as co-chair of the 2016 International Congress of Entomology. He served, as ES he served ESA as president of then IPMIS, who remembers that section designation, now PBT. Secretary and Vice Chair of then Section B, before that, and in various committees. He has been elected the Brazilian Academy of Sciences, California Academy of Sciences. He's an honorary fellow of the Royal Entomological Society, fellow of the American Association for the Advancement of Science, ESA fellow, recipient of the Nan Yao Su Award, which we presented here earlier, silver medal of the International Society of Chemical Ecology, Medi Medal of Science from the Entomological Society of Brazil, and the list goes on and on and on. And we won't get out of here if I keep reading everything. We'll go way past our time that Walter has accomplished in his career. And I want to just finally say that, that there's all these bona fides for, for Walter. The, the, whole li the list goes on and on and on, but um, Walter is a, a, a great guy and a great friend to me. So please welcome Walter to the stage for the Founders Memorial Lecture. Uh, thank you very much, Bob, and thank you all for being here today. Uh, it's a great pleasure to give you this lecture uh, in honor of Tom Asner. Uh, many people ask me, how do you get nominated for this? How do you become the speaker? And how is the uh, honor is selected? Let me tell you a very brief story since we have a little bit more time. Uh, in 2009, I organized in Indianapolis a symposium in chemical ecology together with May Berenbaugh. And we invited as one of the speakers for this meeting John Carlson, uh, who works in Drosophila. And John Carlson came, and he got so excited about the Linnean games that he wants to come back to the society every time. So in 2011, I invited John Carlson to organize, co organize a symposium with me in the meeting in Nevada, and he accepted to do that. This year, we organized also a symposium here, and we already have plans for 2020 to organize another symposium in Orlando. So John Carlos got very involved with the society because of this opportunity that we have. And in that 2009 meeting that we organized there uh, in Indianapolis, uh, Bob Peterson was becoming a member uh, of the Governing Board as representative of PI. And Bob came to talk to me, and I was talking to John Carlos, and he uh, introduced John Carlos to Bob and said, this is Bob Pizza, Peterson. This is one of the pillars of the Entomological Society. And the Bob liked that very much. It's easy praise. You can, it's very cheap to praise people. Uh, and <laughs> John Carlos nominated me. The committee selected. And the Bob Pizza made the final decision. So bottom line, get engaged in the society. Do your homework. Participate in the society. And get to know people and he praised them. For example, at the end of the lecture today, come to me and say, this was a good lecture, even if you didn't agree with that, okay? <laughs> uh, so let's get started in here. 
let's get started here talk about the Tom Asner. Uh, that's a very difficult lecture, and I have to confess that I'm nervous, and I never get nervous about giving a lecture, but this is a very difficult one. Many people ask me, why not May Berenbaum give this lecture? May Berenbaum already gave this lecture in 1994. This is the kind of lecture that you can give you only once in your life, and we hope that someday, not too soon, someone will give this lecture about you. Uh, so, at this meeting, we have 1,100 undergraduate students. So, one of these undergraduate students, when they become a distinguished professor in their life, they maybe talk about May Berenbaum 30 years, 40 years from now. So, let's hope that this thing happens. Uh, Tom Eisner himself, Tom Eisner himself gave a Founders Memorial Lecture in 1969. And here I am today talking about Tom Eisner, and at that time, the honoree was uh, Robert Snoodgrass. Tom Eisner, in addition to his family, he has two main passions. He had a passion about music and about entomology, as depicted here in this cartoon, uh, by the piano and the, by the entomology kids that sit on the top of the piano. Uh, so this is important the legacy from Tom Asner, this piano. At some point in his life, he had the three Stanaway grants, and the, when uh, Parkinson came, that he see that he could no longer pay the piano, he gave these two of this piano to his daughters, to, uh, and one to the music department in Cornell. Uh, and what happens with the kit, the entomology kit, the very important kit that Tom Eisner made the history and walked throughout the world uh, and made dissections and made this uh, such an important discovery that we are going to be briefly mentioned here today. Uh, there is not enough time to talk about everything about Tom Eisner, but I promise if you have a lunchtime appointment, that will be done by then. Uh, so Tom Eisner uh, was born in, in Germany, Berlin, uh, and then he had to flee uh, Germany because of the Nazis. He went to Spain. There was war in Spain. He went to Paris, and Europe was no longer safe. So they went down to Argentina, stayed there for a very period, long, short period of time, moved to Uruguay. And from there, after he graduated from uh, high school, the family moved to the United States for him to uh, get into college. Uh, during this period of time, uh, Tom acquired skills in many languages. Here's the pass of him, uh, the school pass in Uruguay in 1941. In Uruguay, he, didn't, uh, learn, he learned not only Spanish, but he also uh, he improved his skills in English, French, German. So he spoke many languages. First time I met Tom Asner, he spoke to me in Spanish. And I have to confess that I don't like to speak Spanish because Spanish and Portuguese are so similar that I tried my best to speak Spanish, and the native speakers, they normally praise me and say, your Portuguese is so easy to understand. <laughs> so I don't like, uh, so when I met Tom, I, did, I didn't want to speak in Spanish. Uh, here's a sketch of Tom uh, pinning insects uh, when he was the age of 11. Uh, so he already had a passion for entomology right there, and this sketch is made by his mother, Margaret, who was an artist, and his father was a chemist. So he had this heart both in entomology and in chemistry at that time. So he was not decided yet. Here's another picture of uh, uh, the, when Tom was the age of 15. Uh, Paris was liberated by the French and the uh, American troops, and the Tom and the people in Uruguay, Montevideo, was celebrating that moment. Then he came to the United States, applied to college, and he got devastating letters of rejection. Raise your hand if you never got a rejection of anything. Uh, Tom was devastated because he got rejection. But there was one letter from a college, from Cornell University, that he got, and he was shortly, a few days of becoming 18, when he got this devastating letter of rejection from Cornell, from Mr. Williams on the behalf of the admissions committee. And the, the letter is so important in Tom's life that I want this letter to be read to you now. Dear Mr. Eisner, again this year we find our correspondence so extremely heavy that we must resort to this form letter as a means of getting information to you promptly. I am sorry that I must inform you that the Committee on Admissions has found it necessary to refuse your application for entrance to Cornell. 
We had sincerely hoped that the pressures would be less this year, but this has not proven to be the case. It has been necessary to refuse admission to a great many well-qualified candidates because our capacity to provide teaching, classroom, laboratory, and housing facilities has been reached. The committee asked me to express their regret that they were unable to include you among the successful candidates. I hope that you will be able to make a satisfactory adjustment of your plans, although I realize this may be difficult. So, uh, as you see the rhetoric of the letter of those days, right? Uh, so, the tone's response, put that in the language of today. Okay, boomer. <laughs> Tom is not the only one who got a rejection. This guy was not considered up to par to represent his, his high school team, and he made one of two good things as an NBA player. So he might be considered the Tom Asner of NBA. <laughs> uh, Tom made arrangements, and he, wa he went to what we call today a community college called the Chaplin College that existed for a short period of time. And Tom got there, and after two years, he was able to transfer uh, to Harvard, uh, where he got uh, his degree in biology in 1951. In December that the same year, he met Maria Lobel, that later becomes Maria Asner, and became his companion uh, for the rest of his life for 58 years. Uh, together, they raised a family of three daughters, Christina, Viviane, and Yvonne, uh, and the family continues. This is a picture of uh, Tom in 1993 with uh, uh, the second generation there. When the, uh, the three daughters grew up, Maria got more time. She, she uh, got skills in scan electronic microscopy, and she became a partner of Tom for all these years, not only in, in real life, but also in the lab and the, in the trips outside. And it, together, they published more than 40 papers uh, that is co-authored by Maria and, and the Tone. Here's the entomologist that made the Tone shift the balance towards entomology. Like I said in the beginning, he was undecided between chemistry and entomology. And then he decides to entomology because of lectures that he took as, uh, during these undergraduate studies at Harvard, lectures from uh, Frank Carpenter. Uh, and he then decides to go back to Harvard for a PhD program under the supervision of Professor Carpenter. Uh, he worked on the proventriculus of ants. Now you make the association why he gave this memorial lecture uh, on snootgrass, because he was already working on morphology at that time and here are some of the papers that he published in the International Congress in 1958, the Congress in Montreal. Uh, he was not up to par to become an undergraduate student in Cornell, but he was well qualified to secure a position as assistant pro professor. In 1957, he was hired by Cornell, and very quickly he went up to the ladder becomes an associate professor in 1962. Then, in 1966, he was uh, promoted to full professorship, and in 1976, he became the Jacob Gold Sherman Professor of Chemical Ecology, a position that he maintained until 2006 when he retired. He retired officially for the paperwork, but he continued to work until uh, as late as possible in his life. Another uh, important mark of his passage from Cornell was the foundation of the neurobiology and the behavior department that he did together with Dick O'Brien and William Keaton. Uh, for the undergraduate students that luckily are participating in this meeting this time, let me explain this. Uh, the university professorial position, uh, when it comes to a certain level, in order for you to advance, for example, for a full professorship, you get, to get letters, extra mural letters, for that the peers tell us about you. And the Tom got in Cornell the most uh, exciting letters from the outstanding scholars at that time. Here's a letter uh, from no one else than Vincent Dietrich uh, from UPenn. Uh, he praises Tom in this letter, and he goes and say at some point, no letter would be totally objective if you had to gloss over the fact that Tom Asner often rub some people the wrong way. Part of this stems from his high-strung temperamental nature, partly from the fact that he 
abhors mediocrity. Uh, this is highly commendable and all too infrequent in occurrence in our profession. A person who strives towards perfection does indeed tend to irritate others. Is that right? Uh, never noticed that. Uh, on the other hand, Eisner set the even high standards of, for himself than he demand of others. And then he concludes the letter very nicely say, in Eisner, I see a man of excellent character, highest integrity, scholarship, and drive. I conclude somewhat wistfully that I am sorry you do not have space in the table of organization to try to steal him away from you. The message is very clear. Promote to this person. A second one that he got is a letter from this, if you, take, if you look in sex physiology, uh, and you're going to start in sex physiology, you are going to know who Carol Williams is. And in the letter, one excerpt from the letter is that Carol Williams says, in my opinion, we will not be able to hang on to Asner unless he is promoted, or you will be lucky to hang on to him if he is promoted. And they hang on to him until his retirement. So Tom was very loyal, stayed the entire time in Cornell. Uh, one of the many reasons for him to stay in Cornell the entire life is that he met his man here, Jerry Mywald. Gerald Mywald and Tom Eisner became partners in chemical ecology for the rest of Tom's life. Uh, like Bobby mentioned, I did a sabbatical in 1994, a sabbatical leave that only sabbatical that I had, uh, in uh, the lab it was together with Tom Eisner and Gerald Mywald in Cornell. And I have to say that I'm trying to be entertaining here, but it's, I'm very sad. I miss it then. I'm off of them very much. Uh, we cannot talk about Tom Asner without talking about Jerry. It's like the cartoon Tom and Jerry. Can we tell a story about this cartoon? Just talk about Tom. You have to tell a little bit about Jerry. Jerry was such a nice person after being a uh, uh, member of the lab there. I became friends with Jerry for all the rest of his life. And uh, I heard so many interesting stories about Tom Eisner directly from, from Jerry. And I want to record this story, uh, put in a tape for this presentation, but very unfortunately, on April 23, when I was flying from Philly to Ithaca, at that time, Jerry passed away, and we had to resort to the lectures that are somewhere else, the, the videos that are somewhere else because I was not able to put Jerry directly. And we were introduced by a mutual friend who was Howard Schneiderman, mm -hmm. who had you know, somehow knew us both from Harvard. Uh, and when Tom Eisner came to Cornell, <laughs> Schneiderman actually brought him around to my office and said, here's our youngest faculty member in entomology, and he does some interesting work involving insect chemistry, and maybe you can give him a hand now and then. Hmm. And so, I began to talk with Tom Eisner. We'd often have lunch over in the mm -hmm. Statler. And he would tell me, in one lunch, he would tell me about a half dozen different insect stories that seemed to involve <laughs> chemistry. I had a hard job keeping these stories distinct one from the other. And some of them clearly involved chemistry that yep. you could approach and it would be fun to do. And some involved maybe high polymers and I didn't know quite how to work on those problems. He knew a lot of natural history, so he knew the lives of insects in, in great detail. And he had a talent for bringing these insects into the lab, and if they had behaviors that involved chemistry, he would be able to dissect out the glands that contain the active chemicals, mm -hmm. and then he didn't know where to go from there. Yeah. On the other hand, if he brought over a little glass vial and said, you know, here's some stuff that has Interesting biological activity, can you figure out what it is? So uh, Tom admitted himself once that he, uh, he said, I derive my inspiration not from the library or the classroom for interaction with colleagues, but from the times spent observing events out the door. And here's one example of him uh, uh, observing this millipede, blown air in the millipede, and Maria Eisen recorded that uh, photograph in the event. Uh, Always, when he went to the field, he brought this uh, famous kit, and with this kit also in the lab, uh, he dissected so many insects and was able to milk 
uh, venoms and the chemicals and the such important compounds that Jeremiah Wald uh, de determined chemically the structure of those compounds. So at some point, uh, he became the go-to person uh, in terms of if you want to dissect an insect, you want to collect venom, you have to go to, Jer uh, to Tom Asner, as described here by Professor John Hildebrand. When I was just a young undergraduate, I was interested in venoms. And I was doing some work with snake venoms, and I loved it, arthropods. So I decided I wanted to get my hands on some venom from arthropods. So I started reading papers in the literature, and I discovered that there was a guy named Tom Eisner who was sort of the go-to guy for studying arthropod venoms. So I wrote him a letter. This is before, you know, long before there was an internet. And I, I wrote a letter, and I mailed it to him at Cornell, thinking I would never hear from him. Uh, what I did is ask him, how do I milk spiders to get their venom? And he wrote back a lovely letter to me, a real a substantial letter really taking my request seriously and establishing a, a, a very nice relationship, telling me all about what I should do and that I should keep in touch with him and so forth. We remained great friends for the rest of his life. Uh, Tom is considered the, one of the founding fathers of chemical ecology. According to Professor Vitko Frank, uh, the words chemical and ecology came together for the first time in this article in the Scientific America by Lincoln Bra Brower. Uh, in 1969. Uh, the term chemical ecology itself appeared for the first time in 1970 uh, in this book by Sondheim and the Simeone, and the Tom is wrote one of the chapters. Uh, chapter 8 was by uh, Tom Asner on the defense uh, of uh, arthropods, defense against arthropods. Uh, I entirely agree with uh, this statement by May Berenbao that regardless uh, of the paternity, and every chemical ecologist today owes his or her career to the vision and energy of Tom Asner. And he uh, contributed to this field in many ways. Uh, one example here, a very concrete example, that he wrote this article, this editorial article in Science Together with May Berenbaugh. And Gary Felton confessed to me I hope that Rick Rausch is not in the audience, but Rick, uh, Gary failed to confess to me that uh, this uh, article he used to go to the deans at the Penn State to secure a position for chemical ecology and create what is today the most dynamic chemical ecology center in the United States. With that letter, he was able to secure a position to hire uh, Tom Baker, Jimmy Tonlison, Christina Grozinga, and the list goes on and on, and it all was influenced by uh, this paper by Tom Asner. Another legacy of Tom Asner is this one here, this book, uh, The Love of Insect. If you didn't read this book yet, you must read this book. That's highly recommended. Uh, and it has many stories in here in this book that I can't possibly tell you in a short period of time, if, uh, even if I speak as fast as I'm doing. Uh, many stories, interesting ones, uh, and it's hard to pick up one or two that I can share with you today. I entirely agree with uh, Natalie Angier that wrote in the New York Times, try to choose a favorite Ayanos paper. It's like trying to choose a dessert at a Parisian patisserie. So it's very difficult to pick up one. I had to make a decision here and it share with you two of the stories from Tom Asner. Here's one of them is about the Bombardier Beetle. And let's talk, start to talk by himself. And now I'm gonna tell you something, it's not false modesty, it's true. I don't have many ideas. I usually get very good data to support other people's ideas. Yeah, you may not agree that he doesn't have many ideas, but you certainly agree that the quality of the data is amazing. It's very clear cut to a point that it, statistics is no need. Uh, and also he's able to get you together uh, with other people to, le to bring some subject to another level. Uh, Bombardier Beetle, when Tom started to work on that, uh, already known that the chemicals that they make, the mixture, the compartmentalization was known, the enzymes involved, everything was known. But Tom brought this to another level. First, ask, first question that he asked, what temperature is this spray? Everyone knew that's hot, but no one quantified that. 
And he was able to recruit people to his lab, like this graduate student here uh, with a pipe there, Dan, uh, that was, had a, a bachelor's degree in electrical engineering. So he was able to recruit these people, put the right project, and they answered the question. And it based on their ingenuity, they developed the system that they could measure the exact temperature that's coming out, and they also they put the disinsect in a calorimeter and were able to measure the amount of energy delivered by uh, the spray. So uh, for the first time, it was known then that this spray comes at almost the boiling point, almost 100 Celsius, and uh, generates 0.22 calories per milligram of the spray. This was such a fantastic story that it made the cover of science in the issue of the 4th of July, 1964. Nothing better for a cover of science at that time like the firework generated by the Bombardier Beetle. He always uh, wanted to know more, and the next step was to photograph these beetles. That's another uh, skill that Tom had is about photographing. He was very skillful of that and generated wonderful pictures that you are going to enjoy if you see uh, this uh, for the love of insect. Uh, he wanted to photograph and bring the story to version 2.0a, and for those that are millennials, uh, at those times we used films to photograph. Uh, there was no camera, no iPhones, and uh, we used to use a flash and a shutter. Uh, here's how he did. He dimmed the light in the room, opened the shutter, and now any light that comes is going to be recorded by the film. And how we're going to uh, uh, shot this light in the flash in coordination with the action of the beetle. So he pinched the beetle, and the sound that was recorded by the, the spray generated an electricity that connect the flight. So you do this thing once at a time, go back and repeat again, put another film very patiently. But like I said, he was able to generate figure, uh, pictures that shows the precise nature of this spray, how the beetle is able to find exactly where he or she has been attacked. Uh, for example, here in the right leg, in the uh, middle leg, in the hind leg, and even if the leg is up or if the leg is down, the beetle can find exactly the location of the pinch and send the spray to be the most effective possible. So he also did another experiment because he didn't like it to be pinch insect because he knows that's not what happened in nature. There is no forceps there in nature pinch insect in the leg. So he wanted to have an attacker. He used the ants. And in that case here, they use a thermocouple that trigger the flush. In this case here, when the secretion come out, the temperature already changed. And at that point, the flash is activated and recorded. Tom regret later that he was not able to record this picture in color, and the only the black and the white version was available. Like I said, he always find the right person to collaborate to answer his question. Tom had a camera that could record 400 frames per second, and he was trying to record an event that happens in a cycle of 500 to 1,000 cycles per second. So it would be impossible. But this professor developed a new technology that would allow to record uh, 4,000 uh, frames per second. So surely enough, Tom co uh, collaborated with him. And here are these fantastic pictures that they generate together. And they went back and they put another paper in science. This time not as the cover, but another publication in science. Tom has the more than 400 publications. And the main of this publication came in science. And the main of it then made the cover for the science. I counted 21 papers in science and I stopped counting. Uh, and I saw many pictures as a cover of science that I recollect here. It was one picture after the other. So that graduate students at that time just wait for the next exciting story that's going to come from Tom Eisner as a cover of science so that they can discuss in a, a student seminar. First mem the first memories I have of Tom Eisner were, of course, not him, but as a graduate student, uh, reading his papers in science. It was always, you know, waiting for the next great, exciting discovery that he would do with all the intricate, clever stories. Uh, and he was a god to young entomologists like me. 
Uh, this lecture has different styles, and the most common styles that people talk about their work uh, in relation to the work of the Honoré. I decided that everything here is going to be against Thomas, but indulge me to show one slide about my publications uh, and most of the work that I publish, the best work that I have, I send first to PNS. And if PNS reject, I send to science, but I don't send my work to science or nature, I send to PNS. And I have been lucky that more than 10%, I have more than 200 papers, more than 10% of these papers have been published in the proceedings of National Academy of Science. Some of them made even the cover of PNS. Uh, Twelve of these papers uh, and the three commentaries were either edited or invited by Gerard Meinwald. And after Gerard Meinwald passed away in 2018, I already submitted three papers to PNS, and the three of them have been rejected. So let me repeat here, I miss Gerard Meinwald so much. <laughs> so uh, here's Gerard Meinwald. We celebrate his ninth birthday in Kyoto, and he is together here with his wife, Charlotte Greenspan. Kobe Shaw was also a very important figure, organized this together, uh, this event for Jerry Meinwald. So another story is about the female fatal. Uh, and this story, uh, by the way, comes in PNS. Uh, and this story was initiated uh, by Jim Loy uh, from uh, the, the fly, Firefly Dock from the University of Florida. By the way, the University of Florida is the largest department of entomology in the country, 73 faculty and counting. Amazing. Uh, congratulations. Uh, so uh, Jim, uh, who is already an uh, emeritus professor there, he figured out the signal in between these two species. I'm not going to tell the name of this species because you are going to get confused with my accent and pronunciation of these two names. Why don't I call them species A and species B? Uh, species A and species B, both of them, they produce light and they communicate the male and the female with the light. Species A uh, produce the light to attract females, attract males, and they also, uh, at some point after she copulates with the males, she ch changed the lights to mimic the light to species B and attract the species B, and then uh, uh, they prey on that species B. They eat the beetle, the male. The male comes to have fun, and they, they be uh, literally eaten by, by the female. And why is that so? Then that's when Tom Asna gets in the picture. Tom Asna uh, show uh, by using his chemical prospecting project, that's a term that he coined himself, chemical prospecting, they are looking for source of natural product that can be useful in dust, for medicines, for example. And he was working with this beetle, not to look at the light communication, but rather to see a source of uh, chemicals that they could take from there. And they find in the species bay, uh, the one chemical that they call LBG, and that chemical, it was in high content in the species B, but not in the species A, unless the species A eating the species, the males of the species B. As you see here in this picture, all these three graphs shows the black color there is the graph that shows uh, the content of LBG in the species A after they ate the species B. Uh, and you see that it's unfed, there is nothing there, and when it's fed, the, the quantity is very high, no matter the different way that you measure that. This is another example of uh, Asnerian statistic. There is no statistic there, we don't need a statistic for that. It's almost all or nothing. And so uh, he figured out that why this beetle then sequestering these chemicals, what's the importance of that? He went to the next step and he used the jumping spiders uh, to measure what's going on in terms of acceptance or not. If the beetle didn't feed, uh, it's an unfair beetle, as you see in the graph in the black, black bar now, uh, it's sprayed by the spider. But the spider rejects if they fed on the beat of species B. So he clearly demonstrated that by sequestering this chemical, uh, the species A is getting advantage in terms of getting a defense compound that they themselves cannot produce, but they know a very good source of that compound. This work went on uh, with his uh, a graduate student. At the time that I was on sabbatical in Cornell, the guy on the right side there uh, is Andres Gonzalez. Uh, he go, went on and became a uh, famous chemical ecologist himself. He, by the way, 
uh, the vice president of the International Society of Chemical Ecology, as you speak. And Andreas showed uh, in his work with Tom Asner that this uh, defense is not only important for the adults themselves, but also the eggs, the mother protected the eggs by putting these LBG compounds and avoids predation of the eggs. So his legacy goes on, uh, and like all of us, we like to publish, and we like to publish first. We don't like to be scooped. Tom hated to be scooped, and he made it very clear when he met for the first time one famous chemical ecologist, Jerry McNeil. You know, I held him up as, as you know, I'm a dirt ecologist in the chemical ecology field, and went in and I thought this is a, you know, a kindred spirit. And the first time I met him, somebody said, oh, this is Jeremy McNeil from Quebec. And he looked at me and he said, are you the Jeremy McNeil that published on puddling in skippers? And I said, yes, sir. He said, I hate being scooped and turned his back on me. And I was going, you know, I just met my God and he turned my, his back on me. And then he turned around, burst out laughing and said, that wasn't polite. I liked the work, except we were trying to get there before you, but you beat me to it. So he liked to go back to Harvard, collect the Harvard Cent Centennial Medal in 1989. In 1994, Tom got the um, Medal of Science, the highest honor in science in the United States. And here uh, is a letter and the photo of he receiving this honor those days we photograph would be a blessing, uh, but it did, nowadays we have a video for almost everything. Uh, his partner, Jared Mywald, got the same uh, recognition 20 years later, and he, he is receiving the award. National Medal of Science II, Gerald Mywald, Cornell University, for applying chemical principles and techniques to studies of plant and insect defense and communication and for his seminal role in establishing chemical ecology as a core discipline important to agriculture, forestry, medicine, and environmental science. Well, let me repeat it. I miss both of them, literally. Uh, so the second one, second medal at that time, uh, it was made very well the same time that Jeremiah Wald received that medal. Uh, Tom liked to make his own decision. As many of you may know, Tom never used airplanes, never fly. Uh, he likes to uh, move around by car or by train or by boat, but never take an airplane. And no one knows for sure why is the reason. Maybe he felt claustrophobic or for some reason he didn't like it to be in an airplane. I love to drive long stretches, which is a terribly non-environmental thing, but driving without a portable phone, endless distances, I find to be the greatest time to, to relive experiences or, or connect thoughts in new ways. So uh, in 1996, I organized a symposium in Japan a chemical ecology symposium uh, to honor Jeremiah Wald. And the, after that symposium, the first time that I met Tom Asner, he told me, Walter, why didn't you invite me for your symposium in Japan? I said, Tom, you don't fly. And he said, you should have invited me. I would decline. <laughs> so he likes to make his own decision. <laughs> and he, he was, uh, he was a, amazing, creative, and uh, interesting scholar, and the people who was very close to him described that like uh, Wendell Rudolphs. I found that Eisner, as everybody has, he's the most creative and interesting naturalist to have as a friend. And he and I were on many uh, doctoral candidate exams together because we, they would have both of us on their committee. And whenever we were on this, I always look forward to those times because Eisner would end up describing novel other observations and scenarios that were of interest to him, of things happening in nature. And it would turn out to be a learning time for all of us on the committee. 
And sometimes I don't even know if there was a question after his description of that for the student who, who we were examining. He was talking about something that was of interest to him or something new in nature that he had just discovered. And so it was always a learning time for us. Now, as you know, one of our last students together was Shannon Olson. And I asked Shannon also how she remembers Don Osner. The, the experience I had during my graduation party, where in the middle of the party, I, I found him not with the, all the other guests, but actually behind our house in this tiny pond with his wife, Maria, looking for a specific species of mosquito that was only around for those, those few weeks of the year. And so I think if I had to summarize him, I would say that he is a curious, observant child of nature. Tom was also an inspirational instructor. Whoever had the pleasure of attending the presentation by Tom or get a lecture uh, being taught by Tom can testify to that. Robbie Raguzu, who replaced Tom at Cornell, had the privilege of being in the classroom with Tom for some time uh, until he could no longer teach. And here's Robert Raguzzi. Yeah, Tom was a showman. He loved to teach. And for him, teaching was about awe and impact. He wanted to inspire students to be excited about nature. And so he put in all the work ahead of time to choreograph his lectures. Uh, every slide had a purpose. Every gesture, every word had a purpose. He practiced, and he took a lot of pride in his delivery. Together with his colleagues at Cornell, he created the first chemical ecology uh, course in the nation in 1970. Uh, and many people took that class and some became famous chemical ecologists. There was an undergraduate student who attended that chemical ecology course, and his name was Tom Baker. And a couple years later, he came, Bring Carday joined me as a postdoc, and he brought Tom Baker along who was at that time a conscientious objector, and I got him for a cheap price to be a technician in my lab. And then soon he, be, he stayed for a master's and he went on to become world famous himself. If you want to know about the professor, you can go to this site, rate my professor, and you can find, uh, for most professors, this site should be relabeled, hate my professor. <laughs> uh, but it's not the case for Tom. It's all laudatory there, as uh, encapsulating this one in here. This guy is a living legend. He has over 500 published papers and he has been the pioneer for the field of chemical ecology. His storytelling is fantastic. And all of the stuff he talks about is just so interesting. And the praise goes on and on. You can visit this website and it is all there. Students like to thank Tom because that was so inspirational, his lectures, that after the course, they would send notes and the written notes to Tom and the uh, various uh, cards. There are so many facets about the Tom Eisner that's impossible to describe in a 30 minutes letter, uh, lecture. So I apologize for not being able to cover so many things. There is one facet that I'll let uh, Paul Finney describe for us. Um, Tom has an amazing sense of humor. Um, it's hard to describe, it's uh, quite diverse, but uh, Part of it is political. He clearly is, um, uh, has very little patience for um, much of what goes on in Washington. <laughs> and um, his, he, he can actually make you laugh at his sarcasm sometimes. It's, but uh, he always has funny stories to tell Often on the elevator, we, you know, we would be coming up to the fourth floor of, of our building and it's time for at least one joke on the elevator. Um, you'd have everyone in the elevator giggling by the time we got off on the fourth floor. Here's, here's a good uh, Linnean game question. Who was May Berenbaugh major professor? I'm sure most of the students were going to say the guy on the right, but it's wrong, the guy on the left, Paul Finney. Uh, Paul Finney was a uh, May Berenbaugh major professor. So, like I said, Tom Asner uh, is uh, the person that he was a, like a complete scientist that he liked music and very well educated. 
he loves his music and also entomology. So let me shift a little bit for this, the side of the music. He played in, in, uh, at meetings. Uh, one of the persons that he plays with, Jelly Atema, uh, mentioned that I have played with many outstanding musicians, but the way Tony and I play bar sonatas was a method. Of course, he played with Jerry Meinwald at many chemical ecology meetings. We are blessed to have the opportunity of listening uh, to the music played by both of them, or at least one of them at a time. He appears here uh, playing uh, the flute with Jane Houston and the Marina Gilman singing. So he was an inspired entomologist, an accomplished musician, a very complete person, as described here by Bert Holdobler. Tom Eisner is one of the greatest scientists I, I knew, uh, and he is uh, uh, one of the most witty uh, colleagues and friends I knew, and he was a great uh, artist and uh, gifted pianist and conductor of an orchestra, so he was one of the last Renaissance persons I have uh, ever met. Very well, a summary of Tom Eisner. And now the question, where is Tom Eisner kit? Who inherited Tom's kit? Uh, this very famous entomology kit that he left, he brought to the field, he brought to the lab to dissect insects, and they make these all wonderful stories that are there. And also, this book that he got as a present when he was 12 years, becomes turning 12 years old, the parents gave this book to Tom, and where is this book now? So uh, the answer for this question is that Tom gave all these presents uh, to a 14-year-old naturalist in the making, according to Tom, in this card. And he did that five months before he passed away. So all these special gifts went to, uh, let's have a look at them now, the real one, I'm showing you the photograph, but let's have a look at the original entomology kit that's now inherited by Tom's protege, Catherine Angier. Please welcome me, uh, join me in welcoming Catherine Angier to the podium. She went on, that's when she was a little kid in here, and she went on and got, uh, just graduated last year from Princeton, uh, summa cum laude in biology. She used that kit, so it's going to tell you the story about that now. Here's the letter that she got from Tom Asner. Thank you very much for coming. The podium is yours. Hi, thank you uh, so much for having me here. It was probably one of the most surprising emails I've ever received out of the blue when he was doing a lot of this in-depth research that have obviously gone into making such an amazing memorial lecture. So thank you, Walter. Um, I really never thought it would lead to this, um, but yeah, I met Tom when I was five years old. And um, even before then, as you could see probably from the four-year-old picture, I was a little bit uh, symptomatic with the severe bug obsession. And um, I always loved collecting caterpillars, looking for crickets, um, stopping to look at every ant on the sidewalk. But meeting Tom was really something special because he obviously valued, even as a capital A adult, this you know exploring nature, the childlike wonder of it all. And um, we went to his house in Ithaca and just wandered around a field looking for bugs together. And even my kindergartner brain knew it was something I would never forget. So for the next almost decade, I would write him letters describing cool bugs that I would see or behaviors. And he was always so encouraging in his replies and even sent me a dissecting scope that um, I could use to examine them. Um, eventually, I couldn't read his replies anymore because his Parkinson's was getting worse. Um, and when I was 14, he did send this kit, which at first I was really happy about because it had all these really cool things in it. But then when he died shortly thereafter, I realized it was kind of a goodbye kit and apparently uh, inheritance. Um, but um, I did, I hid it away for a long time because it was um, no longer had positive connotations. But that all changed senior year of college. I started this senior thesis research on uh, an ant plant mutualism in Panama, and I decided it was time. I felt like I was finally going to join the world of entomologists, so I brought him with me, and I thought it was kind of a good luck charm. So thank you, Tom, for 
being there with me. <laughs> and I just want to say that I hope he'd be proud that I came from, I guess, a kid hardly able to pronounce the word entomology to now applying for a PhD in one. So thank you for all sharing in this experience of honoring such an amazing man. And thank you to Walter for inviting me. Can you display it, please? No, no, uh, uh, I, <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, it is. Thank, thank you very much. And uh, uh, Catherine is going to be here. And if you want to have a look at the kit, you can go back to the table. And it, it, she's going to show you the kit uh, uh, available to you uh, if you want to have a look at the real one. So I want to conclude here by thanking everyone that helped me. I was not able to use everyone's input in this presentation. Too much material. I should write a supplementary information for this uh, lecture. You put it in YouTube because I have so much material that I got for so many colleagues. I appreciate so very much uh, the uh, effort and the time that you put to all these people. So I'd like to dedicate this lecture to Tom Eisner on behalf of 7,000 entomologists. And thank you very much for your patience and for your stay up to the end. Thank you. Well, that was a fantastic presentation, very uh, humorous, informational, but also very, very touching, I think. So, Walter, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Bobby. I, I'll take the plaque, but the check I'll give to the Chris Island Fund, now the, the fund that we have for the society. So can you, the society reroute the check back to the Chris Island Fund, right, that you announced yes. last time. Thank you, Thank you very much. Uh, it was my honor. I have to pay to give this lecture, not get paid for it. Yes, yeah, so thank you so much, Walter. What he did was uh, turn his check over to the Chrysalis Fund um, for youth education in entomology. So we greatly appreciate that.